Hello. After passing through the portal of power and the plains of peril, perhaps you are pondering peace and prosperity. Pah! Your journey is far from over. We've got about 10 more editions to look at. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today we're completing our quest to examine the history of Talisman. That's right, this is the history of Talisman. Founded in 1989, the Swedish rock legends behind I'll Be Waiting and Mysterious, this time it's serious. Last time, we found out that the late great Marcel Jacob had just recruited... Wait, that's a different video, sorry. <laughs> no, this is actually a video about Talisman the board game. In part one, we found out how Bob Harris, the original creator, invented the game because he wanted a simpler version of D&D to play with his friends. He then took that game to Games Workshop, who published the first edition in 1983. That was the same year they released a board game designed by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Seriously, it is a very strange insurance sales game, and you can find out more by watching my video about it here. The second edition of Talisman was released in 1985, and it was a runaway success. There would be a raft of expansions released over the next eight years. All of those are detailed in part one, which you can watch here. This video is about the third, fourth, fourth, and fourth edition of Talisman, as well as all of the video games and spin-offs that were released. If you enjoy it, please feel free to leave a like. Last time, we saw that Bob Harris and Games Workshop were not in agreement about how to move forward with the Talisman license. Games Workshop wanted to release a game stuffed with plastic, Bob Harris was just not sure how that was going to work, and eventually he walked away from the project, leaving the license with Games Workshop. So what were they going to do? The third edition of Talisman is a remake with a ton of plastic included. Released in 1994, this edition made an effort to revamp and refresh Talisman for a new audience. And to do that, GW brought out the big man himself, Jervis Johnson, designer of Advanced Hero Quest, Blood Bowl, and myriad other classics. The production would be a full update with completely new art in the 90s GW house style. Expect to see a lot of vibrant reds and disembodied skulls. And it was to be presented in a classic GW big box stuffed with that lovely Citadel plastic. The intention for this edition was to streamline gameplay, reducing playtime to something a little more manageable. Earlier editions could occasionally run over by more than a few hours days, weeks, and months, and generally, they wanted to simplify things a little. Perhaps the most drastic change came with the removal of the entire inner region. Surprise! Instead of progressing through this final stage across the squares on the board, when players crossed the causeway from the middle region and entered the wizard's tower, they would instead begin drawing from the tower deck, leading them to face the Dragon King and to attempt to claim the Crown of Command themselves. There were only 11 characters included in the base game of the third edition, with familiar favourites like the Troll left out to make room for more Warhammerian flavoured characters. In fact, there is still some debate about whether or not we can conclusively say that Talisman 3rd edition was set in the Warhammer Old World. There's some obvious stuff that supports the theory, like the appearance of Skaven and Goblin Fanatic characters in the game. These were pretty well rooted in Warhammer lore. The Crown of Command appears in many editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battle as a magic or enchanted item. It even makes its way into the mortal realms of the Age of Sigmar as an item that can be found in the Warhammer Quest Shadows over Hammerhall game via the White Dwarf campaign Return to Hammerhall. And then there's the fact that the models used to represent the characters in the box are the same Citadel miniatures that were released for Warhammer in many cases. Unlike the miniatures line for the second edition of Talisman, which featured unique sculpts for all the characters, even the 40k ones, the likes of the Minotaur, Skaven Warrior, and many of the wizards that would join the Talisman quest are identical to their Warhammer counterparts. These are the same guys. In opposition, there's stuff like Skaven already existing in Talisman. They were in the French Hero Citadel magazine, and I don't think many people would argue that Talisman 2nd Edition is set in the Warhammer world. Plus, the locations that we see on the game board don't really match what we know from the Warhammer history. And the Crown of Command that appears in the Warhammer game is in a much diminished state compared to the power of the crown in the Talisman game. Who was the wizard as well? Was that supposed to be Drakenfels or someone like that? I suppose it could be. I, I guess we'll never have a definitive answer, and that's okay because it's a totally 
trivial and intangible question. It has no impact whatsoever. It's just fun to debate it, I suppose. If we did have a definitive answer, it would shroud the mystery and the fun of the question. And as a wise man once said, I can't let go, I can't let go. It's so mysterious. The art for this edition is prime GW of the era. Artists Wayne England and Jeff Taylor, who produced much of the 90s Warhammer fantasy art for army books and other releases, are absolutely let loose here. So much of the art has a lively, almost cartoony vibrancy, with all of the humour and character seen across Games Workshop games at the time. Just look at this toad. What an absolute unit. Magnificent. And of course, there are a lot of skulls here. I got 26 in a quick count of the game board. Awesome. There were three expansions for the third edition of the game, starting with City of Adventure in 1994. City, inspired by the second edition expansion, added two board sections, the City Board and a Forest Realm. In an inspired bit of design, these corner sections actually wrap around the corners of the main board. There were plenty of new cards and six new characters included as well. Some of those were the Black Orc, the Chaos Dwarf and the Assassin and the advanced careers from the previous edition's city expansion also reappeared, so you could level up as a Master Thief or a King's Champion. Also released in 1994 was the Dungeon of Doom. Drawing on Bob Harris's OG expansion, this set added a dungeon corner board and a mountain region as well. Again, there's loads of new cards and six new characters included. Joining the quest this time are a host of new plastic wizards, some of which were actually given away free in White Dwarf 186, along with a Chaos Warrior and a Beastman. The final expansion was released in 1996, and it is arguably the most visually impressive of all Talisman expansions. This was the Dragon's Tower. As with the other expansions, there were more cards and characters included, such as an Astronomer and a Chaos Sorcerer, but the real magic of this expansion lies somewhere else. This is where the decision to remove the interior region from the main board is revealed to be a canny trick played by Jervis and GW. In this expansion, you received a three-tiered tower, constructed from cardboard that could be placed over that central space on the board. Now, players who crossed the causeway had to fight their way up the tower, literally, getting to the top where they would face the physical manifestation of the Dragon King, a beautiful citadel dragon. Seriously, this was always set up in my local store's window. It was just so amazing to see. It was as impressive on the hundredth time as it was on the first time you had seen it. I'm not surprised that this was the absolute must-have expansion. There were other characters added to the game through the pages of White Dwarf magazine. In issue 177, there would be four new characters, a war dancer, necromancer, dragon rider and thief. White Dwarf 179 would offer an ogre and a dark elf for the game, and issue 186 included character cards for a swordsman and a vampire. In 2002, Jervis Johnson discovered a few lost characters on his computer, and they were released as a PDF on the GW website, as well as making their way into issue 62 of Games Workshop Mail Order's black and white catalogue magazine, Troll. This set of four characters actually included three that had been released in White Dwarf already, the Ogre, the Necromancer, and the War Dancer. The final lost character was the Pit Fighter, apparently developed for playtesting, but which never made the final cut. In 2003, the third edition of Talisman was reprinted, and as part of an advertising push, a couple of those White Dwarf characters, the Vampire and the Thief, were included in issue 37 of Game Trade magazine. There were plans to reprint more of the White Dwarf characters in GTM, but apparently they ran out of space to include them. <laughs> the third edition of Talisman is a perfect encapsulation of the 90s GW era. It is this colourful, over-the-top box stuffed with Citadel plastics and yet nods to the Warhammer world in just a really fun bundle of stuff, I guess. This is actually the version of the game that was on the shelves when I was first getting into the hobby. I didn't really get into it at the time, but I am pretty certain that if I went back and played it now, I would be hit by floods and floods of nostalgia. It just, it really is of a time for me. In 2007, video game producer Capcom were developing a version of Talisman for PlayStation Network, Xbox Live Arcade, and PC. The intention was that it would release around the same time as the upcoming fourth edition of the board game. However, in 2008, Capcom pulled the plug. 
One of their senior leaders described the development process as a misfire. It had cost way more than they expected it to, and they were out of the talisman game business. The rights reverted to Games Workshop. At the same time, an independent developer, Tim Street, was working on his own unauthorised version of Talisman, which would actually get several different editions and updates before Games Workshop caught up with him and shut it down on legal grounds. Digital development of Talisman was dead, but the fourth edition of the game? Well, that would make it to shelves. More than once. Three times, in fact. Fantasy Flight Games announced that they had acquired the rights to publish new versions of classic Games Workshop games in 2008 as part of a broader collaborative deal. Whilst this would ultimately see many new games released, it was some of the reissues that were prompting the most excitement, and first amongst them was Talisman. There had actually been a Talisman 4th edition, published by Black Industries the year before. This new version of the game updated the art and took the game closer to its pre-big box roots, even returning to the cardboard standees rather than miniatures. And it included some additional game design work by none other than Rick Priestley. Black Industries also made a couple of bonus cards that were included with direct sales from their website, the Rod of Ruin and Arena adventure cards. And they made a PDF of extra characters available as well. The Gnome and the Hobgoblin, based on the Leprechaun and Hobgoblin from the original Talisman expansion set, and the Pixie, based on the Sprite from the Talisman dungeon expansion. Black Industries was the role-playing arm of Black Publishing, the publishing arm of Games Workshop. So when the FFG deal went through, all of their titles moved across to Fantasy Flight. It's probably fair to say that the Black Industries version of Talisman is the most recognisable to many people, at least by one metric, and that's because it features in TV sitcom The Big Bang Theory in its first few seasons. They play it all the time. Uh, <laughs> I kind of always knew those guys were toads. Although a lot of the graphic design and rules would remain the same between the BI and FFG versions of the 4th edition, there would be some changes when Fantasy Flight took over. Designer John Goodenough, the man behind the Runebound game and the World of Warcraft game, was brought in by Fantasy Flight to make some further revisions to the rules. The release would include plastic miniatures for the characters once again, along with some lovely new minis to represent the toads. Four, in fact, each given a different shaped base so that players could keep track of which one was theirs in the event of a catastrophic multiplayer toading situation. This revised fourth edition would also include a new mechanic, Fate, that would allow players to spend tokens to re-roll certain dice results like moves or card effects. As this was not included in the Black Industries 4th edition, FFG released an upgrade pack that included replacement cards that allowed players to use their BI version of the game with all of the new rules and upcoming expansions from FFG. And boy were there expansions! There were 14 in the 10 years between 2008 and 2018. They would come in different formats though. There were big boxes that would have new characters and cards and board sections. There were small boxes which would have new characters and cards and concepts. And then there were also some print on demand card packs as well. The Reaper small box expansion would introduce the Grim Reaper itself as death stalks the players around the board. There were four new characters included too, including the Dark Cultist and the Merchant. There were a couple of pre-order bonuses for this expansion, Adventure Cards, Doppelganger and Instructor. The Frostmarch small box expansion brought with it the return of the alternate ending mechanics from Talisman the Adventure set from 2nd edition. New characters included the Ogre Chieftain and another 2nd edition legend, the Leprechaun. After the introduction of the alternate endings in Frostmarch, FFG released some bonus cards online. These included a new version of the Crown of Command and the Dance Macabre, an alternate ending that required the Reaper as well. In 2009, the first big box was released. The dungeon was back. The new region board took the same corner style that we'd seen in 3rd edition, and the new characters from the box included the Amazon and the Swashbuckler. In 2010, the Sacred Pool was released. This small box included new characters like the Chivalric Knight and the Dread Knight, and added stable cards that let you recruit new mounts for your characters. As well as that, there were neutral cards that could grant boons and punishments according to your alignment. The second big box expansion came in the form of the Highland expansion, also released in 2010. 
adding a new Highland corner board section. This box included over 100 additional cards and components, six of which were new characters. These included the Valkyrie and fittingly the Highlander. 2011's Dragon expansion would remind of the 3rd edition Dragon's Tower set, as it included a double-sided board that was placed over the inner region. The Dragon Rider makes a reappearance as one of the new characters, along with the mighty Minotaur. In 2012, a new small box would seek to add an element of gothic horror to proceedings. The Blood Moon set would introduce new mechanics for day and night, with certain nocturnal creatures gaining strength in the dark. This set, unsurprisingly, included a werewolf monster and a vampire hunter character, and also gave us a chance to catch up with the horrible Black Void after all these years. Fantasy Flight would eventually end their relationship with Games Workshop, sacrificing the right to continue producing Talisman. Production and design on existing and new products for the Talisman range would be taken over by Pegasus Spiel. It's also worth noting that up to this point, Every expansion for the 4th edition had been designed by John Goodenough. That is a mammoth undertaking worthy of praise. And he wasn't done quite yet, but first there would be an inning of relief pitching from a fresh arm. In 2013, John New, founder of the Talisman Island website, would design the Nether Realm expansion. This is the first print-on-demand set, and includes a host of cards for the Nether deck, a set of dangerous foes and events that are used in the three new alternate endings from this set. In 2013, John Goodenough returned for his final big box expansion, The City, adding the city board into the 4th edition game and introducing characters like the Cat Burglar and the Spy. 2014 would see a new expansion designed by Samuel Bailey, co-designer of the incredible Forbidden Stars 40k game released by FFG. This was the Woodland expansion. This big box finally added the fourth corner board, and brought new characters like the Ancient Oak and the Spider Queen to the table. Bailey would be the designer for the majority of the remaining expansions for the fourth edition. The same year also saw the Firelands expansion, a small box that added terrain cards to reshape the board, and characters like the Dervish and the Jinn Blooded. In a neat bit of serialized storytelling, the next expansion was the Harbinger, and it introduced the Omen deck alongside new characters like the Celestial. Whenever you share a region with the ominous Harbinger, you draw omens rather than adventures, and the destruction he foretells is cataclysmic. And that's because the final big box expansion for the game, released in 2016, was the Cataclysm itself. The devastating event meant that the central game board is entirely replaced by a new post-apocalyptic one, and old foes like the Black Knight have sallied forth from their castle on the board to join the quest across the map. In 2015, John New and Samuel Bailey also designed an additional print-on-demand set, the Deep Realms, that makes further use of the Nether deck and offers new methods of traversal across the board. This would actually be re-released in a bundle with the Nether Realms in 2018. <laughs> wow, that is a lot of talisman. I can't even begin to imagine what it's like to play with some of those expansions, let alone all of them. And that's not even to take into account the 12 characters that were released as promos through the German Mephisto magazine. In fact, there are over 85 playable characters available for the 4th edition of Talisman. I think there's one thing we can definitely say about the revised 4th edition, and that is that it's very well supported. In 2013, Talisman would go to somewhere it had never been before, the 41st millennium. Sure, in the second edition expansion, Timescape, we had seen Space Marines and other 40k characters make their way into the Talisman game, but it had never been set in 40k, and that was going to change. Now, we were going to go to deep space. Relic was released by Fantasy Flight Games as part of that decade-long licensing arrangement with GW. Taking Talisman as a base, the game rules were redeveloped by revised 4th edition designer John Goodenough and Jason Walden, the designer of several expansions for FFG's Game of Thrones board game. This game is set in the Antian Sector, a corner of Imperial space that is beset by Xenos, demons and other threats on all sides. Players take on the role of mighty heroes of the Imperium, such as a Space Marine, Ogryn, Commissar or Sanctioned Psyker. Rather than include full miniatures for these characters like those in the 4th edition of the game, or even Sith Citadel miniatures like the 3rd edition did, Relic features only character busts for each player to use. This is presumably a result of the FFG license and being unable to produce competing miniatures for 40k, 
but even if it is legally sanctioned like our friend the Psyker, I still think it's a bit of a shame. Players move around the regions of the board attempting to complete missions, gathering enough strength to proceed to the inner ring where they will encounter a scenario sheet in order to win. The board for this game is a beauty, calling out familiar concepts from 40k lore alongside the well-designed cards and components it offers an immersive setting for the game. Two expansions were produced for Relic. First, there was Nemesis in 2014. Designed by Alex Davey, a developer for much of the Star Wars Legion and Armada lines, this set would introduce a Space Hulk's worth of new competitive mechanics, allowing more intense player versus player combat through new game modes. It also introduced new busts for the Xenos enemies that players face, like a Chaos Space Marine and a Gene Stealer along with two new playable characters, an Eversaur Assassin and a Stormtrooper Sergeant. There were other new rules like becoming an apostate if you used illegal alien technologies, and of course, some new scenarios for players to conquer in the endgame. The second expansion released in 2015 was Halls of Terror. This set was designed by Samuel Bailey, designer of some of those 4th edition Talisman expansions, along with Tim Flanders, designer of 2017's Legacy of Dragonhold. Halls of Terror introduced a new game board to Relic, the heart of the Imperium, the Soul Sector. The game included a host of new game cards intent on simulating the dangerous politics of the Imperium and came with a new nemesis, another traitor space marine, and three new player characters as well, a terminator, a navigator, and a sister of battle. It also had some new scenario sheets to allow for even more win conditions for the game. Despite the popularity of the 40k universe in general, and Talisman in particular, Relic never really seemed to take off. It received mostly middling reviews, and its fate was sealed by the end of the FFG-GW relationship. It just never turned into the runaway, talisman in the 40k universe success that many people wanted. But it was not the only game that would attempt to try talisman in 40k. In fact, a few years later, and 10,000 years worth of lore earlier, Nomad Games would release Talisman Horus Heresy, for iOS, Android, and Steam. The game took the basic mechanisms of Talisman and reworked them into a digital board game that saw players take on the role of loyalist or traitor marines and working with or against three other players in competitive or team-based modes. The Horus Heresy version of the game is no longer available, having been expunged from all records in 2020, but Nomad's other Talisman games are still available to buy. Before Horus Heresy, in 2012, Nomad had published Talisman Prologue, a single-player version of traditional Talisman on Steam, consoles, and eventually mobile as well. Two years later, this would be expanded to become the Talisman Digital Edition. This was literally a digital version of the classic game, top to bottom, designed around online and local multiplayer, with up to six players competing to claim the crown of command. It also retained Prologue's offline single-player mode, that allows you to go up against AI-controlled opponents. After that, Nomad released Talisman Origins. This was primarily a single-player experience, described as a questing game in the world of Talisman, that spans 100 challenges and multiple story campaigns, things like the forging of the Crown of Command or the rise of the Dragon King. In 2018, Pegasus Spiel released Talisman Legendary Tales. This is an introductory board game that offers solo and cooperative play set against the backdrop of the Talisman world. Together, the players are seeking the lost talismans before they fall into the hands of the forces of evil. As a much more kid-friendly game, the setup is built around a map of hex tiles, as dictated by one of the five adventure scenarios included in the box. You progress around the map, draw tokens, fight monsters, and try and find the magic loot before time runs out. The game was developed by prolific designers Michael Palm and Lucas Zack, the team behind Bang the Dice Game and Aventuria Adventure Card Game. An extra character was produced for Talisman Legendary Tales, the Druid, with all of the boards, tokens, and standees necessary to play them, and released as a promotional incentive. The following year, Pegasus Spiel went even further in their expansion of the Talisman world and game line. They released an RPG. Talisman Adventures is set against the backdrop of Talisman, the place of a myriad fantasy creatures and locales, and of course a history of misrule under the now dead mighty wizard whose crown of command and magical talismans have been secreted across the world. 
The lead designer for the game was Ian Lemke, a very experienced game developer with credits including the original Changeling The Dreaming, many other White Wolf books, and supplements for the more recent Modifia Star Trek adventures. Have a little look here if you want more history on that game. There have since been a number of game aids, scenarios, and companions for the game, and from the look of things, there's more on the way as well. Much as you can now play Monopoly against the backdrop of many different IPs and worlds, they started to retrofit Talisman so that you could play it in different franchised universes as well. In 2019, there were a couple of these re-themed games. One was Talisman Kingdom Hearts. Set in the world of Kingdom Hearts, a video game that itself is a merging of Square Enix and Disney properties, this Talisman game sets players on a quest to gather enough strength to seal the door to darkness. In this version, you might not get turned into a toad, but you can become a heartless. The game is described as maintaining the beloved aspects and exploratory spirit of earlier versions of Talisman whilst offering a light-hearted Disney nostalgia. Peddling nostalgia as entertainment? No, I have no idea what you're talking about, officer. The game is based on Robert Harris's original rules, but with significant revisions developed by Cami Mandel and Eliza T. Cami Mandel designed several Disney-themed games like Munchkin DuckTales and Mickey and Friends Food Fight, as well as co-designing the largely well-received Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle cooperative card game. Eliza Teague had worked on the Apocrypha adventure card game and a range of Geek Out party games as well. The other franchise Talisman game released in 2019 was Talisman Batman Super Villain Edition. This is a game that really intrigues me actually because I'm a big fan of Batman and DC in general. You might actually be able to see behind me just up here there is a massive flying fox model, the uh, Batman plane from the recent movies, and I might actually do a DC RPGs video at some point. But <laughs> before I get sidetracked by Batman once again, Let's get back to the Talisman game. Talisman Batman Supervillains Edition takes the rogues gallery of the famous hero as its starting point. The game sees players taking on the role of those Batman villains, lots of the big names like Joker, Two-Face and Bane, plus the officially best Batman villain, Clayface. I'm sorry, it's official, there's nothing I can do. And there are many more villains to boot. You are all trying to escape Arkham Asylum, progressing from cells to guard posts to the staircase of the tower and into the control room, where you will face down the Batman himself for the final time. I'm not sure how play friendly the small scratchy text is on this game's board, it's very scaled back visually, but I like the design of this game a lot. And whilst you're in this asylum, you don't get toaded, you get deranged, which I don't know, isn't as cool as Batman fighting giant toads, I guess. The game was designed by Patrick Marino, who also worked on several of the Rising games, as well as the die-hard Nakatomi Heist board game. Curiously, there has yet to be a superheroes edition of Batman Talisman, so I don't know why they use the naming convention Supervillain Edition. Just seems really strange to me. In 2021, there would be two more franchised versions of Talisman everyone's favourite story of a magical child who has inherited great power that would allow them to challenge the status quo and upturn the entire universe, only to discover that actually, after all is said and done, things remain exactly the same. Yes, it's both Star Wars and Harry Potter. In Talisman Star Wars, you get to play as characters from either the light side or the dark side of the Force, racing around familiar locations in the Star Wars universe in an attempt to be the first to face Emperor Palpatine himself. The game draws on the entire history of the franchise, so there are old and new characters available, including Luke, Womp Rat Skywalker, Darth, Sand-Hating Vader, and Kylo, Kylo Ren, Ren. In keeping with the light side, dark side approach, you can only battle characters who are of an opposing alignment. And when you reach the Sith Citadel, or Sithadel, you have to fight Palpatine. If you're a bad guy, you want to kill him and take over his empire. And if you're a good guy, you want to kill him and restore order to the universe. Like Relic, the playing pieces for this edition of the game take the form of character busts rather than complete minis, except for Darth Maul. That's a pretty accurate view of him at the end of episode 1. And once again, this is a talisman where you can't become a toad. You just get disoriented. Sounds like bantha dung to me. <laughs> A promo card set was released alongside the base game while stocks lasted that included four additional encounter cards. Amongst them, 
the legendary Millennium Falcon, iconic battle droid and Sith TIE fighter, and Zori Bliss was there also. Star Wars Talisman was designed by Sean Fletcher, the mind behind several Smash Up and Disney Sorcerer's Arena expansions. That other 2021 release was of course Talisman Harry Potter. In this version of the game, players take on the role of Death Eaters or members of the Order of the Phoenix, in an attempt to progress towards and around Hogwarts to get to the Dark Lord first. Finally, one of the franchise versions of the game takes Talisman seriously. Instead of getting turned into a slimy toad, in this game, you become a ferret. The character lineup includes lots of favourites like Hagrid, McGonagall and Malfoy. Like Star Wars, you can only battle with other players if they aren't on the same side as you. And then when you get to Voldemort, all of the players still have to fight him, either to prove your worthiness or to defeat him. I totally get this approach. It makes sense to keep things balanced, or at least as balanced as you can get in a talisman game. But given how stark the good guy, bad guy fights are in Star Wars and Harry Potter, it really seems like a shame that they didn't come up with opposing win conditions. In both cases, you just fight the bad guy and then win by defeating him, where I think there could have been something a little bit more interesting depending on which side you were on. Again, as with Star Wars, there was an early purchase incentive with a promo pack of object cards, though there were only two in it this time, Bezor and Felix Felicis. The Harry Potter edition of Talisman was again developed by Cami Mandel, the co-designer of the Kingdom Hearts version of the game. All four franchise versions of Talisman were released by the company The OP, also known as USA Opoly, and that's the company that's behind all of those Monopoly versions with different franchised IPs as well. That makes me think we've not seen the end of picking up different versions of the game of Talisman and dropping it into different IPs and worlds. I would be very surprised if it was anything other than the Marvel Universe coming up soon, but here's my pitch. A game that deserves the true and dedicated version of Talisman that it never really got. How about Talisman Warhammer? So there you go, a whole host of Talismans and Crowns of Command are plenty. It is wild to think just how many versions of the game there have been over the years and how many expansions there are. There is so much Talisman available if you want it. For me, the game is best when approached casually. You have to accept that there's going to be a surfeit of randomness and a deficit of strategy, but that levels the playing field and means that no matter how much skill or experience you have with board games, you can get together with friends, you can look at what's going to happen and just laugh about the hilarious poor look and the incredible good look that people are going to have. And of course, you can join in that chant, Toad, Toad, Toad. In fact, I think that that is the best song that has ever been released by Talisman. No offence, Talisman. <laughs> I hope that you've enjoyed this roll and move extravaganza. I've really enjoyed sharing some of the history of Talisman. If you want to leave a like or a comment or a super thanks, I would really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I want to take this moment just to reiterate just how amazing the Talisman Island resource is. That's a great website. Go and check it out if you want to find out more. They do terrific work there. John New has set up something really special if you're into Talisman. Thank you very much for watching. I am Jordan and this is Jordan Sorcery. So if you need some loot in, come play this game. I'll be rolling right by your side. Everything changes, but toads they'll remain. I'm awaiting a rap for the ride. <sighs> Talisman. <laughs> this is my most embarrassing one yet.